Lord bless you. Let's just remain standing a moment as we bow our heads. Is our special request, if you would, let it be known as you lift your hands to God and say, By that, Lord, you know my need. Heavenly Father, we are indeed a, a privileged people this morning to be assembled in the house of God when we know that there are so many that would want to be in the house of God this morning and is in hospitals and beds of sickness. And Thou has given us this privilege to be out here today. And we never come, Lord, to be seen of each other, though we love our fellowship one with another. But we could do that at our homes. But we have come here to fellowship with He who has brought us together as beloved children and brethren. We thank Thee now. And the only way that we know to correctly fellowship with Thee is around Thy Word. Thy word is the truth. We gather here for spiritual strength. We need it, Lord. We must have strength to endure the crosses that we bear. And we pray that you'll send the great Holy Spirit today and will strengthen us all. Yes. Grant the request of your people as they have assembled and raised their hands to you that they have need of such things. Answer each one, Lord. We thank Thee for sparing the life of our sister Ungren last night in the accident on the road up here. Thou was gracious to them, Lord. And we thank Thee for that. And now we pray, Heavenly Father, that You will continue to be with us and help us as we journey on. Each and every one of us, give us Thy undergirding power and the the faith of knowing that Thy never-failing presence will be with us. That hour when we cannot help ourselves, we know the angels of God are encamped about those who fear Him. And they'll bear us up lest any time we dash your foot against the stone. We pray now that You'll give us of Thy blessings for the Word and speak through us and in us. In Jesus Christ's name, Amen. I am grateful that the sunshine of the outside, the solar sun, is shining. It was very bad this morning, and I think in this country especially, we have so much gloomy, wearied weather. And to see the sun shining coming out, it's very good. There's a little family reunion today. I meet my brothers, and they're up at my sister's house, and some of our relation around. Uh, the city and the roundabout. There's a big bunch of the Branhams that had all come together from Kentucky and here. I guess we'd have to rent the city. <laughs> There's a, so many of them. But just a little homecoming. We used to all meet at Mama's house and she was the old tie post that held us together kindly, but God taking the tie post to heaven. And I hope that we'll all meet there someday. And now... I spoke the other day. I said, you know, I believe that I will will cut my Sunday messages down to about 20 minutes and, and 30 and then pray for the sick. And I thought of that this morning and I thought last night when Sister Downey called me and said that, called Billy and said that she and Sister Hungren on the road up had uh, slid across the road and had had a wreck. And uh, while Billy was still at the window along, I don't know what time it was, maybe this morning sometime, I'd been asleep for quite a little bit. I looked down at Brother Woods, the lights was out, and I just knelt to pray. And when I did, something just said to me, it's all right. So then I told Billy, tell her it, everything I thought would be all right. I'm so glad to see them in this morning, You're sitting in the house of the Lord back here after on the road of people at love you that much to come for hundreds of miles to hear the gospel. Then I thought, a 20 minutes message, and it was slow as I am, it would be no good. So I thought I would just uh, that long. So then, here Brother Ungren, her son this morning, singing, How Great Thou Art. He has, it means more to him this morning than it did 
yesterday afternoon because the great God of heaven spared his precious darling mother and sister. Now, today, we are expecting a great time in the Lord. And I had two or three different texts here that I was looking at. And I didn't, couldn't figure just which one I would talk on this morning. One of them was, cast your cares on him, for he cares for you. Now, if he cares, why not you? <laughs> so then, another one, Billy Paul, or not Billy Paul, my other son, Joseph, brought me this text a long time ago. He's sitting in the room one day, and he said, looking up towards the picture, and Billy, or Joseph is very fond of boats, like little boys, boats and horses, you know. And he said to me, Daddy, has Jesus got a boat? <laughs> and I said, I don't know. So then after he got up and went out, I happened to think, has he got a boat? And I took a text from that and just marked it down here on my book. Has Jesus got a boat? And I happened to think, when he was here on earth, he had a, a barry, a womb to be born in, a grave to be buried in, a boat to preach from. But he's the pilot of the old ship of Zion. Amen. Sure he has. But in those texts that I was thinking, thinking maybe I could get them later before we leave to go back. You know, I like to speak from the tabernacle here because... It's our own church. We feel at liberty to say whatever the Holy Spirit says. At other places, even though the man wants to make you welcome, you feel kind of a little cramped because it, that you're in somebody else's church and you want to be a gentleman enough to respect their, their thoughts and their doctrine. Amen. had a wonderful time this week down at Brother Basham's place there. And, uh, I went into the factory where the made the cheese. I see him and his wife and son and them were present this morning. And I always thought that a cheese factory would be something like other places I've been in, all kind of sloppy and dirty. My, I can say one thing. You sure rest assured that place is not dirty. That's the cleanest place I ever went into, in a, especially in a factory. Um, and I didn't realize. I thought, oh, maybe they'll make a hundred pounds of cheese a day. And they make six tons each day. And three of the factories going. I thought, oh my, who eats all those cheese? <laughs> but the Lord has blessed this man and had the privilege of being in his home, a very lovely home, a fine, consecrated wife. And there's no reason why they shouldn't live for Christ each day as they're doing. Met his sons and their very fine children. We're so grateful for this fellowship that we have one with another. Found out their former pastor was a a man that I know, Brother Gurley, a very fine man of the United Pentecostal faith that I met years ago in Jonesboro, Arkansas. And I didn't know that they were that was his pastor, though. Now, remember the services this evening, and then the Lord willing, next Sunday again, we ha hope to speak, and then the, I think the following Sunday, then I have to go to Chicago, then I'll be gone for a while. Um, have to take the family back home, back or back to Arizona, so that the uh, children can enroll in school again. And then um, we uh, quit pastoring the pastor taking his services. Hey, so. <laughs> so we are very grateful to Brother Neville for his hospitality. You know, of, of in, inviting me. And he's so not. The, I like Brother a man like that where there's no guile, there's no selfishness. It's just. Genuine Christianity. I like them. Now, we're going to read some of the Scripture. And then pass the comments. And I don't know just what time that we get out on these long messages. But I think I was talking the other day about speaking so long. And someone said, well, now, if you, if you just spoke a few minutes... And you speak kind of in mysteries anyhow. I said, we, we'd never be able to understand it. said, so just keep on talking. After a while, it comes out. He said, so maybe the Lord wants us to do it that way. Let's just bow again. Lord, thy word lays open on the pulpit. And realizing that someday it'll be closed for its last time. Then the word will be flesh. And then we are, we're grateful for this time this morning and open to us by Thy Holy Spirit the contents of this Word that we shall read. 
May the Holy Spirit teach us today the things that we ought to know. And may we then in return listen closely to every word, weigh it deeply. And then may those who are listening by the way of tape, may they listen close. And may we be able to catch what the Holy Spirit's trying to reveal to us. While we realize if He should anoint us, then the anointing is not in vain. It's for a purpose that it might work to the good, to the Lord. And may our hearts and understanding be open, Lord. May we have freedom to speak and freedom to hear and access to faith to believe what we have heard as it comes from God's Word, that it might count up to us eternal life in the great day that is to come. Bless us today. Condemn us when we are wrong. Let us know the faults that we have. And bless us in the way that is right, that we might know which way to go and how to act in this present world. That we might bring honor in our living here to Jesus Christ who died to give us a life in the great hereafter. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I want to read just out of two places out of the Scriptures this morning. And one of them is just uh, found over in the book of Exodus. Frankly, both of them are out of the book of Exodus. One, the 13th chapter and 21st and 22nd verse. And the next one is the 14th chapter, the 10th, 11th, and 12th verses. Now, I'll read from Exodus 13, 21. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them the way, and by night a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. He took not away the pillar of the cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. Now in Exodus 14 and the 10th verse. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. And they were sore afraid, and the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. And then said Moses, Because there... Beg your pardon. And they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. I'm going to read a couple more verses. And Moses said unto the people, Fear not. Now listen close here. Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. The Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? Speak to the children of Israel that they go forward. But Lift thou up thy rod, and stretch out thine hand over the sea, and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And I, behold, I will harden the heart of the Egyptians, that they shall follow them. And I will get me honor upon Pharaoh, and upon all of his hosts, and upon his chariots, and upon his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten me honor upon Pharaoh and upon his chariots and upon his horsemen. And the angel 
of God which went before the camp of Israel removed and went behind them. And the pillar of the cloud went before their face and stood behind them. And it became between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. It was a cloud of darkness to them, but it gave light by night to these, so that the one come not near the other all the night. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night, and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry ground, and the waters were a wall unto them on the right hand and on the left. And the Egyptians pursued and went in after them in the midst of the sea, even all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And it came to pass that in the morning watch the Lord looked down unto the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and the cloud and trouble the host of the Egyptians and took off their chariot wheels that they drave them heavily so that the Egyptians said, Let us flee from the face of Israel for the Lord fights for them and against the Egyptians. The word of the Lord is so great, so good, there's just no way to stop reading it. Amen. It just becomes life as we read it. Hallelujah. I think in this text this morning, though it's being taped, I want to say this in the beginning, it finds, I find myself. And the reason that I, yesterday while in study, and I come up on this subject, and then I thought, I'm just going, to, if the Lord willing, to speak upon that because it drives me down. And I hope it drives us all down, that we might see and cause us to look up and to study a little bit in comparing the day that was then the, and to the day that is now. Yeah. I want to take three words for a text. And that is, why cry? Speak. God said to Moses here in the 15th verse, Why criest thou unto me? Speak to the people that they go forward. And why cry? Speak. Now, we got quite a subject, and I'll try to hurry through as quick as possible as the Holy Spirit leads. And I want to think of, the, of this text of Moses crying out to God in the time of trouble and God rebuking Moses back, right when trouble was in, in session. And it's just nature, seeming like, for a person to cry out and then... What a, a rebuke it is for God to turn around and rebuke him for saying it, for crying out to him. It looks like it's a very hard thing. Many times when we look at the Scriptures in our own way of looking, it seems very hard. But if we study a little while, we find out that the all-wise God knows just what he's doing. And he knows how to do these things and how to deal with man. He knows what's in man. He, he knows him. We don't. We only know from the intellectual side. He knows what's really in the man. Moses was born in this world as a gifted boy. He was born to be a prophet, a deliverer. He was born with the equipment, born in him. As every man that comes into the world is born with this equipment. As I firmly believe in the in the foreknowledge of God, the predestination, not that God is willing that any would perish, but all might come to repentance. But being God, He had to know and does know the end from the beginning. Amen. If He doesn't, then He isn't infinite. And if He is not infinite, He isn't God. Amen. So He wasn't willing, certainly, that any should perish, but he, he knowing who would perish and who would not perish. That's the reason the very purpose that Jesus came to the earth was to save those that God, through His foreknowledge, seen that wanted to be saved. Amen. Because the whole world was condemned. 
And I don't see how we could teach it any other way than the foreknowledge of God. And the Bible plainly says that he knows the end from the beginning Amen. and can tell him. Therefore, when a, a person tries to be something that they are not, they are only making an impersonation. And sooner or later, it will find you out. Your sins Amen. find you out. You cannot cover them. There's only one covering for sin. That's the blood of Jesus Christ. And it cannot be applied unless God has called you from the foundation of the world. That's what that blood was shed for. Not to be tramped upon and made fun of and, and jobbed at and, and evilly spoke of and, and so forth. It was for a direct purpose. That's right. Not to be played with. Not to be impersonated by saying that the sins are covered when they're not. And no man can have his sins covered lest his name was put on the Lamb's book of life before the foundation of the world. Jesus said himself, No man can come to me except my Father draws him. And all that the Father hath past tense given me will come to me. Amen. So you can't make the words lie. They are there for truth and for a correction. And Moses was born with a gift of faith. Great faith Moses had. We see it after a while coming out in him. And he was born in a great family as we know how that his father and his mother and come from a family of Levi, which the story here previously to this in the book of, of Exodus so beautifully gives the life of this great character. And he was one of the greatest characters of the Bible, for he was strictly a type of the Lord Jesus. He was born in a very odd birth like the Lord Jesus. He was born in a time of persecution like the Lord Jesus. He is born to be a deliverer like the Lord Jesus. He was hid of his parents away from the enemy like the Lord Jesus. And he come to his time of service like the Lord Jesus. He was a leader like the Lord Jesus. He was a prophet like the Lord Jesus. And he was a lawgiver like the Lord Jesus. And we find out that he died on the rock and he must have rose again. And everything because 800 years later he was standing on Mount Transfiguration Amen. talking to the Lord Amen. Jesus. Hallelujah. Angels packed him away. No one knows where he's buried. Even the devil didn't know that. Amen. Frankly, I don't believe he ever was buried. <laughs> I, I believe that the God packed him away and, and uh, he died on the rock that he had followed all the days of his life. And he was a perfect type of Christ. He was a king over the people. He was a lawgiver. He was a, he was a, a sustainer to the people. He was everything... And, and type that Christ was. Now, then see that he was born with this great gifts and quality within him. Then it only taken something to flash across that to bring that thing to life. Ever. See, the seed of God is actually placed in us from the foundation of the world. Amen. And when that light first strikes that seed, it brings it to life. But the light first has to come up on the seed. Like the, I've talked many times of the little woman at the well. Her in that condition, though she be a, an ill-famed person, though her, her life was uh, degraded, and she was in that condition because that traditions had never touched her. But though when that light first struck her, quickly she recognized it because there was something there to respond to it. When the deep calleth to the deep, there must be a deep somewhere to respond to that call. And Moses here was born this prophet, but he was raised in an intellectual school. And Pharaoh's palace, the Pharaoh's city that he was raised up under, was a man that still had honor and believed Joseph, being the prophet of the Lord. But there come... Ramesses after Seti and Ramesses did not care about Joseph. And so therefore, there's when the trouble started. Now when they're raised up a Pharaoh who did not know Joseph. But these great qualities, let's speak of them just a little while and before we get to the main part of the text. 
I have an odd way of setting a text and then building to it. And the Lord help us this morning as we build to it. Uh, Moses being born with this great gift of faith, then he was anointed and commissioned at the burning bush to deliver God's people. Hey. Now, see what great qualities this man had. He was born for a certain thing. God had a purpose in it. God's got a purpose of you being here. Amen. If you can only be uh, get to that place, how much trouble you save God in yourself too. Moses born, and then uh, he was afterwards. He was brought to the the place where he was anointed. And notice the seed laying there with an intellectual conception with all the faith that he was born to deliver this people. And yet it never come to life until that light from the burning bush flashed across it. Until he seen not something he read about, but something he seen with his eyes. Something that spoke to him and he spoke back to it. Oh, how that did bring things to life. I think any man with a or woman, boy or girl, and I think in an intellectual conception of what they think the Word is and so forth, never can have a full foundation stand until they have met that light that brings that Word to reality. I think no church in its practice, no matter how intellectual and fundamental it might be, that church cannot thrive until the supernatural is made known among that people and they see it. Something that they can talk to that will talk back to them that vindicates this written word. I remember when Moses met this burning bush, that word was vindicated exactly. It was the word. Moses didn't have to worry. What's this voice all about? What is this being here? Because God had already wrote on the Scripture in Genesis that your people will sojourn in this strange land, but they'll be brought back. After 400 years, will come back into this country again. For the... The iniquity of the Amorites is not yet fulfilled. Now, hundreds and hundreds of years before God had said that Israel would sojourn and be mistreated in a strange country and would stay there 400 years, but God with a mighty hand would bring them out. So you see, with this burning bush, Moses know this intellectually. And the seed that was born in him was laying in his heart. And he tried through his intellectual experience with the Word to try to, to, to bring him out, to deliver him, because he knowed he was born for that purpose. He knowed that the time, the Scriptures all said that they'd already been there 400 years. Just as we know now, as a man asked me a few moments ago about the coming and the rapture, we know we've lived the time out. At the time... Uh, the rapture is at hand. And we're looking for a rapturing faith that can pull the church together and give it some supernatural strength that can change these bodies that we live in. And we see a God that can raise the dead off the floor or out of the yard and bring Him back to life again and present Him before us. When we see a God who can take a cancer that's eat a man to a shadow and raise him up to a strong, healthy man, that ought to give rapture and faith to the people. That when that light flashes from the sky and the trumpet sounds, the body of Christ will be quickly gathered together and changed in a moment and taken into the heavens. Yes, there's got to be something like that happen. And our schools of theology can never produce that. Yet they intellectually are all right. But you've got to meet that light. Amen. You've got to find that something. And here Moses basing his great call upon the Word. And it was great until one day he met this light. Amen. And the very Word itself spoke back to him. Then he got his anointing. Amen. That anointed what he had in him. 
That on the inside, the, the intellects that believed it, the faith that was based upon his belief in God that separated him from his mother. And now when he strikes in the presence of this light, it anointed that that he believed. See? What an anointing. And he was commissioned. Now we know intellectually he had heard his mother. He knew what was going to take place. And he knew he was living in that day. But here he found out that he was a failure, so he might have, his faith might have dropped back a little bit. But then when he comes to the bush, God said, I have heard the cries of my people. And I remember my promise to their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I have come down. I, there the, the personal pronoun, I have come down. To deliver them. Amen. And now, and may I just add this, if it, God forgive me if it sounds sacrilegious, I do not work upon the earth only through man. I, I, I am the vine, ye are the branches. And I only declare myself when I can find a man, and I chose you. Amen. And I'm sending you down to take them out. Amen. See? Now, notice. I'll be with your mouth, and I. you take this rod. And Moses said, can I see an evidence that you'll send me, and you've anointed him, and you're going to do these things. So what you got in your hand? He said, a stick. He said, throw it down. It turned to a serpent. He fled. He said, take it up. It turned back to a stick. He said, put your hands in your bosom. Took it out in his leprosy. Put it back, and it was healed. He said, he saw the glory of God. There was no more question to Moses. Amen. Did you ever notice he never run to the wilderness again? Amen. He knew he was anointed. He knew where all these things that had been in his heart, these great fine qualities, and he, they were anointed. Now he, he's ready. He's ready to go. So down towards Egypt he goes. God had said, I'll be with you. So that, that settles it. If I'll be with you, that's all Moses had to know. For this great call in his heart, and now God said, I'll be with you. Now, God also had vindicated his, Moses' claims. Moses claimed, I met the Lord. And he said, tell you, I am sent me. See? Now, they said, here's a man, another Jew. Probably some of these fanatics that's been coming along all time with all kinds of scheme to take us out of bondage and you know how people are when they're slaves or in bondage for something? There's always some kind of a gimmick coming around, you know, to do it. So Moses, God promised Moses, I'll be with you. I'll be in you. My words will be your words. You speak my words. Just say what I say. And now when Moses went out and gave him this call and stood before Pharaoh and told him the Lord God of the Hebrews said, bring the children out. And he wouldn't let him go. So he, he performed a sign before the elders and before Pharaoh. And the signs that God did. He said, now tomorrow, about this time, the sun will go down. There will be darkness all over Egypt. And it come to pass. Amen. Just exactly. And then he said, uh, there, there's coming flies upon the, upon the land. And he stretched forth his rod and called for flies. And flies come. And he prophesied. And everything that he prophesied happened just exactly the way it was God. See? God had called him from his birth, put qualities in him of great faith, and then come down with his presence and anointed that great something in him and sent him down with his word. And he was properly vindicated of his claims. No matter how many quacks had raised up, how many these other things had happened, God was speaking at Moses was identified. Amen. Moses, what Moses said, God honored. Amen. I want you to never forget that word. What Moses said, God honored because God's word was in Moses. Amen. I'll be with your mouth. It'll speak the right things. Now what God says what God says, He speaks it through Moses. And it confirmed and vindicated His claims. Also, He was told by His mother of His mysterious birth. 
And how that the time of hand come close to the hour that there was to be a deliverance, uh, Amram and, and Josebel, the sons and daughter of a Levi, begin to pray to God to send a deliverer. And it take, when you see the time of the promise drawing nigh, it sets people to praying and to hungering. And no doubt that uh, Josebel had told him many times, his mother, as she was his tutor also, as we know the story, and had told him how that she had prayed, and Moses, when you were born, son, you were a proper child. You were different. There was something taking place at your birth. I gave a drama on it for the children not long ago and said, while Amram was in the room praying, he saw an angel pull his sword and point it towards the north and said, you'll have a child and he'll take the children north to the promised land. Given a drama for the little fellow so they'd understand it. That their intellects hasn't come up to the place that you adults and can grasp the things as the Holy Spirit reveals it to you. Now, uh, though his mother told him these things and he knew this, yet he needed uh, another touch. The, the teaching was fine, but he needed a personal contact. That's what the world needs today. That's what the church needs today. That's what everyone needs. That sons and daughters of God in order to be that, you need a personal contact. Amen. See, something, no matter, you know the word's true. You know it's right. But then when it contacts, and then you see the thing done, then you know you're on the right road. Amen. See, and watch, it'll always be scriptural. It'll stand right with the scripture because this did. Amram's prayer. Well, just exactly with the Scripture. Their prayers is with the promised Word. God promised at that time to do it. They prayed for it, and here was a proper child born. Amen. And they, watch. Oh, how I love this. Amen. See, in the hour that Pharaoh was putting to death all the children. See, putting them to the, to the sword, the guardian sword. They, they, they stabbed these little children to death. Fed them to the crocodiles, the little bodies, until the crocodiles were perhaps fat upon the bodies of Hebrew children. But the Bible said that the parents did not fear Pharaoh's command to kill the children. They didn't, they weren't scared because they seen something in this baby. To begin with, they saw it. That this was the answer of prayer. And now Moses had all this as a background. Uh, so Moses knew he was sent for the very purpose to deliver the children of Israel. See, all the background is heaps up. When you get anything and can bring the Bible saying this is going to happen, here it happens. This is going to be at that time, here it happens. This is going to be at a certain time, there it happens. Then it all accumulates together and draws a picture for us. Oh, how this tabernacle this morning. How we people at this hour, Brother Neville, as we see the gray striking her hair and her shoulders stooping, when we see the world weaving and rocking as it is, and how we can look around and see the promises drawing nigh. It's, it, it, I think many times if someone could just bounce into it at once and wouldn't understand it, or would understand it rather, uh, and come into it at once, it would almost send you to eternity. Just with a, such a rapture and thing and never know it, and just all break through the things that we have seen and know and yeah. understand and all bounce in at one time. The man or the woman, boy or girl, would just probably lift up their hands and say, let's go, Lord Jesus, you see. Oh, how the hour is so close. Moses, knowing that he was born for that purpose, and looked out of the windows and watched them Hebrews as he... A toil. Look back here in the scripture and it said, And they shall sojourn 400 years, see? But I will bring them out with a mighty hand. Then when he comes back after a commission, anointed, know that he was born in his faith. Look, by faith he saw those people and know they were the children of God because the world, the, the word said so. They wasn't of the world. It wasn't like the rest of them. They were different. And they were cranks and fanatics to the, the high clamor of Egypt. And he was to be the son of Pharaoh, taking the kingdom over. And next, but he, there was something down in him, a, a real faith that looked not at those things, the glamour that he was to inherit. He looked at the promise of God. 
And he knew that the time was drawing nigh. And what that man must have thought of, I want to talk it over with him someday when I meet him on the other side. You say, a crazy bird. No, it isn't. I'm going to meet him by the grace of God. Yes, sir. I'll talk to him someday. Moses himself. And how I would like to ask him is how, when he's seen his preparation, how the frustration, the devil said, oh, the people ain't going to believe you. Oh, there's nothing to that. But when that seed come to life up there, something struck him. And he knew that something's going to take place. He knew, looked at the clock and seen what time it was. And he knew, and how he must have thought as he watched. Now, when he got all this together, all this great thing that he's seen, the scripture time, the prayer of his mother and his father, and he was born a peculiar birth, an odd child, and all along there'd been something way down in him. And now he slips off and tries to think he'd take his military training from his school and deliver the children, and that failed. Then he goes up into the wilderness and marries a, a lovely Ethiopian girl, and they had a little boy named Gershom. And one day while tending the flock, all at once he's seen a bush up on top of the mountain burning. And he went up there, and uh, not an intellectual, not uh, an imagination, not a delusion, an uh, optical delusion, but in him there was the God of Abraham. In a light, a pillar of fire, back in a bush, that fire, like waves going out, but it didn't bother the bush. And the voice of the Scripture, the voice of God, spoke to there and said, I have chosen you. You are the man. I raised you up for this purpose. I'm proving to you here by signs. You're going down to deliver the children because my word's got to be fulfilled. Oh, his word of this day's got to be fulfilled. We're living in the hour. No matter what anyone else says, the word has to be fulfilled. Heavens and earth will pass away, but not his word. Now, when Moses got all this together and seen by every direction, it anointed his faith. Amen. Oh, my. What a thought. This uh, self itself seeing the Scripture pointing right straight to what it was and the speaking of God and the evidence of it there, he anointed what faith he had in him to go to work. Amen. What ought it to do to us? We need a repentance. We need a revival. I'm saying myself. I need a shaking. I need something. I said I was speaking to myself this morning or about myself. I, I, I need a, a waking up. And when I think of that great evidence, everything so perfectly laid out there and it anointed the faith of Moses. And my, he seen there was nothing. Here he run from Egypt. With actually, he could start a, a mutiny or, or something, and he could have he could have rose up and start a revolutionary in Egypt, and could have took an army uh, uh, and fought. But you see, and had many thousands on his side. But instead of that, he was scared to even do that with armies on his side. But now here he comes back forty years later, eighty years old, with only a stick in his hand. Amen. Why? What was burning down in his heart had become a reality. He was anointed then. Amen. And he knew he had thus saith the Lord. Amen. There was nothing going to stop him now. He needed no army. God was with him. That's all he needed. God with him. Oh, when you know God has sent you to do a certain something, and you see it moving up there, 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 this isn't nothing can take its place. That's all. Amen. I remember times when the Lord has told me about certain things is going to happen. And then I move up and see it laying right there. How, oh, what a feeling. The situation's already under control. That's all. See? Because God said so. Amen. I remember, many of you remember about the little boy been raised up in Finland. And then from the dead, been killed by an automobile. And I stood there on the side of the road and started to walk away from that child and turned and looked back. And something put its hand on my shoulder, and I thought it was Brother Moore. And nobody was around me. And I looked back, and then I looked up the mountain. I saw, I said, well, I've seen that hill somewhere, but we didn't come up this way. We come another way. Where is that hill? And I looked and seen that car down there, wrecked, 
seen that little boy there with his laying there with the, the croc black haircut as we call it here and the eyes turned back like Brother Ways was the other day when he fell and the little foot run through the sock where his little limbs was broken blood out of his eyes and nose and ears and seen his little short trousers and tied up by buttons his, uh, here on along the side of his little waist and his little stockings up like long stockings like we wore many years ago. And I looked around, and there was exactly, exactly the way the Holy Spirit had told me two years before when all of you wrote it in your Bibles across the nation, that would happen. Oh, there, then the situation is in hand. No matter how dead he is. No matter what anybody else says. It's all over. Amen. He's got to come back. Amen. I said, if this child doesn't raise up from this dead, then I'm a false prophet. I'm a misrepresentation of God. For in the homeland two years ago, he told me this would happen. And there are these ministers and all. Oh, it's wrote on the flyleaf of our Bible. And here it is exactly. Read it off the flyleaf. How it would be in a country lapping rocks and so forth. Be killed on, be on the right-hand side of the road. I said, there it is. Nothing can stop it. The situation's already under control. The faith that was within my heart was anointed. Oh, if I could only explain that. The faith that God I had in God that told me had it never failed, told me the situation is under control now. Here's exactly what I showed you two years ago. And here it is laying just exactly in order. The only thing you have to do is speak the word. And the little boy rose up from the dead. See, I was thinking and looking back at Brother Fred Sothman sitting there and Brother Banks Woods and the other day up on the, the Alaskan Highway. How I stood you at the church and told you all of an animal that looked like deer horns, 42 inches, and a silver-tipped grizzly bear. I've never been there before and how that the, and I was going to get this and how it would be and how many would be with me and how they'd be dressed. You know it, every one of you. Weeks and weeks before it happened. And there, when I moved in there not knowing it, there laid that animal. And I went in, and he was impossibility if a hunter would know or be listening to this tape how you can't walk up in the face of an animal and jump up and run. But he didn't. And there he hangs in my den room. There hangs his silver tip. Just exactly the way in a, in a rule laying there, a tape measure to show his exact, and a horn will at least shrink two inches or more when it's green on the animal and when it dries. But this never shrank. It's still exactly on the nose, 42 inches. Amen. There lays the silver tip. It's seven foot long, just exactly, and everything exactly the way it was laying there now. But when this man said to me, Now, look, Brother Branham, we got this animal that you talk about, but you told me you'd get a, a silver tip grizzly before you got to the bottom of the hill. Back to where them boys are, that with the green shirt. I said, it's thus saith the Lord. God said so. Amen. A brother Ram, he said, I can see all over everything here. For miles, there's nothing. Where's he coming from? I said, that's not for me to question. God said so, and he's Jehovah Jireh. He can bring a bear there. He can put one there. And he did. And there he is. It's a situation under control. And when Moses saw that he was raised up for this purpose, and he had met face to face this great God who had made the call and had anointed him and identified him and said, This is your call, Moses. I'm sending you. And I'm Amen. going to show you my glory. And here I am in a bush burning. Go down there. I'll be with you. He didn't even need a stick. He had the Word. Amen. The vindicated Word. Amen. There he went. It anointed the faith that was in him. And it anoints us when we see that we're living in the last days to find out that all these signs that we see being taken place 
that's spoke of in the Scripture would take place in the last days all the way from heaven to the political powers and the nature of the people and the demoralization of the world and among the women and how they would do in the last days and how the men would do and how the churches would do, how the nations would do and how God would do. And we see it all laying right here on us. Oh, it anoints our faith. Amen. It moves us out into great cycles. Yes. See, it, it, it separates us from other things of the world. Yes. See, no matter how little we are, how much a minority we are, how much we're laughed that made fun of, it don't make a bit of difference. Amen. That's all. We see it. There's something within us. We were predestinated to see this hour. Amen. There's nothing going to stop us from seeing it. Amen. 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 God has spoken. It's, it's already happened. Amen. We see it. Oh, how we thank God for this. Oh, then it brings out your faith when we see these things happen. Here. Now, here again, we read that Moses esteemed the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. Now, he esteemed the, the reproach of Christ. Now, remember, the reproach of Christ. See, there's a reproach in serving Christ. If you're very popular with the world, then you cannot serve, you're not serving Christ. Amen. No, you cannot Amen. because, uh, see, there's a reproach that goes with it. The world always has reproach. Way back there, thousands of years ago, there was a reproach that went with it. And Moses, to be Pharaoh, he was the next coming Pharaoh, Pharaoh's son. And he was coming the next Pharaoh with favor amongst the people, and yet he regarded Esteem means to, to regard. He regarded the reproach of Christ greater things Amen. than all that Egypt could afford to give him. Egypt was in his hands. But yet he knew to take the way of Christ was a reproach, but he was so happy to know that there was something within him that made him regard this approach of Christ Reproach of Christ, rather, greater than the, all the glamour that he, he inherited. He had an inheritance inside of him that was far greater than what the outside inheritance had given him. Oh, if we could be like that today and let the Holy Spirit anoint that, that we have within us, that faith, to a godly life consecrated to Christ. Now, with such faith as this that he had, he noticed and he re regarded that reproach an honor. Today, somebody say, hey, are you one of those people that was, uh, 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 well, uh, you're just a little ashamed of it. But he regarded a greater treasure than all the world because that there was something in him that he could speak out and say, yes, I, I regard this. This is highly honored. I'm glad to be one of them. See, I'm glad to number myself as a Hebrew and not an Egyptian. The Christians today should say the same thing. I'm glad to regard myself a Christian, to abstain from the things of the world and the order of the world, not just as a church member, but as a born-again Christian who lives according to the Scripture. Though I be called even by the members of the church a fanatic, yet I, I, I esteem that a greater, greater thing than what if I was the most popular person in the city or in the Amen. nation. I'd rather be that than president in the United States or, or the king over the earth, you see. I, I esteem that so highly because God in His mercy before the foundation of the earth, world saw me and, and placed a little seed in there that my faith would fire above these things of the world. And now He's called me and I, I regard my place. As Paul said, Amen. He regarded His office with high. Oh, uh, God had called Him from being a great... A uh, teacher like Gamaliel. But Paul had been called to be a sacrifice for Christ. I mean, now the same thing. Notice. With such faith, he never relied on his sight. What he could see now, he seen nothing out there but a bunch of uh, mud-handling people. Slaves. In prison. Being killed every day. Beat with be whips. Made fun of. Their religious beliefs was fanatics. And there was a Pharaoh sitting on the throne that didn't know or regard anything about their religion. He knew nothing about it. He is a heathen. So he just, what a picture of the day. And there it is, a different religion. And how that if, if this Moses, yet 
in the very seat with the president or the, or the great man, Pharaoh, to take his place at his death. And he was an old man. And yet Moses thought that that call, he looked out there and the same window that Pharaoh looked out of, because he was in his home, and Pharaoh looked out and seen those people that were lifting up their hands and they'd take a whip and beat him to death because they were praying. They run a sword to them because they even failed to disobey at any time and making them work till their little old bodies would fall out and give them half enough to eat. Well, there wasn't nothing but a bunch of fanatics, not hardly human. And yet Moses, that faith in him, looked upon them. And he said, they're God's blessed people. Amen. I like that. With such faith, his eyes didn't fall on the glamour of Egypt. It fell on the promise of God. Amen. His eagle eye of faith seen beyond the glamour of Egypt. He Remember, he's becoming an eagle now. He's a prophet. Hallelujah. And his eagle eye raises above those things. Oh, how I like that. <laughs> My, how oft today, today Christians rely on their senses in, of what they can see or what they can understand instead of their faith. To rely on what you see with your eye and the glamour. Like you women, I'm always calling to you about you must let your hair grow You mustn't wear makeup. You must act like ladies and Christians. You look out upon the street and see the women today dressed in Marley. Well, you think, well, uh, the, she belongs to church. Why can't I do that? See? And uh, uh, she cuts her hair. Why, why can't I do that? Or she seems to be just as sweet and as much intellectual and personality that I haven't even got. Well, why can't I do that? I often do it. When you do that, you paralyze your faith. You don't give your faith a chance to grow. Start on that. As I said, someone said, Brother Branham, the country, the people regard you as a prophet. You ought to be bawling women out like that and man out for these things. You you ought to be teaching them how to, to prophesy and receive gifts. I said, how can I teach them algebra when they don't even know their ABCs? See? Now, just start from that. Clean yourself up so that when you walk out on the streets, you'll look like a Christian anyhow, see? And then go to acting like one, see? And you can't do it within yourself. It's got to have Christ come within you. And if that seed's laying in there and that light hits it, it's going to come to life. If it doesn't come to life, there's nothing there to come to life because it sure proved it on others. It comes to life immediately as soon as the light hits it. That's a rebuke to women. I know it's listening to this tape or will listen to it. It's a rebuke to you, sister. It should be. It should be because it shows, I don't care what you've done. You might have uh, been religious all your life. You might have lived in the church. Your father may be a minister. Or your husband might be a minister. But as long as you disobey the the Word of God, it shows there's no life there. When you see the thing brought out and the life of the Holy Spirit, watch it when it strikes others. See what they do. If it brings it on them, no wonder. Why would what, what a rebuke to those Pharisees that called Jesus when he could perceive their thoughts? He called them Beelzebub. And that little prostitute said, Why, this fellow is a Messiah. The Scripture says he'll do this. See, that predestinated seed was laying there, and when the light struck it, it came to life. Now, you can't keep it down. You can't hide life. You can take a poor concrete upon a bunch of grass. And kill it in the wintertime. The next spring, where is your most grass at? Right around the edge of the concrete. Because that germatized seed under that stone, when the sun begins to shine, you can't hold it. It'll wiggle its way around through there and come right out at the edge of that and stick its head up to the glory of God. See, you can't hide life. When sun strikes botany life, it's got to live. And when the Holy Spirit strikes the scriptural life that's in a man, it brings forth its fruit right there. So regardless of how true and honest you are, how you say you're not in speaking, saying there were these women wearing these, uh, these bad clothes and things out there, just a common strip tease for the street, though you don't believe you are. You can't make you believe. You can prove that you're innocent of an adultery. But in the book of God, you're committing adultery. Amen. Jesus said, Whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after us, committed adultery with her in his heart already, and you presented yourself in that manner. See, you can't see it unless that life is laying there. You look at somebody else, you look and say, Well, I know Sister Jones, Brother Jones is, uh, is a minister. His wife does this and does that. I don't care what that does. This is the Word. Amen. 
Jesus said, let every man's word be a lie and mine be true. It's the Bible. And when that light really strikes it, it's got to come to life. It just has to come to life. Now, Moses' great eyes, eagle eye, look beyond the glamour of Egypt. The real Christian believer today, no matter what the church says, what anybody else says, when that light strikes and they see the very vindication of God, that pillar of fire hanging there and the signs and wonders that promise the Scripture being laid in, it comes to life. Amen. No matter how little it is and how many in the minority, God's group has always been the minority. Amen. See, fear not little, little flock, it's your Father's good will to give you the kingdom. See, they catch it. God is obligated to send them in from every denomination, every order, everywhere to see it. If they are ordained to life. Look at old Simeon, ordained to life when the Messiah come in the temple in the form of a baby in his mother's arms. Simeon back in a room somewhere reading, the Holy Spirit raised him up for he was waiting that life was in him. He said, I'll not die until I see the Lord's Christ. And there was a large Christ in the temple. The Holy Spirit led him from his duty out and walked down through there and picked that baby up and said, Let, uh, let thy servant depart in peace, for my eyes see thy salvation. Amen. There was an old blind woman in the corner by the name of Anna who served the Lord day and night. She also was predicting and saying, The Messiah is coming. I can see him coming. Yet she was blind. At that same time, when he was there, that little life that was in her, that was predicted it would be there, it would be there, it would be there. Then that same life, the light come in, the building in the form of a baby, as an illegitimate child, wrapped in his swaddling's clothes, coming up through the building, and the Holy Spirit struck that old blind woman, and she come by the Spirit led to the people and stood over this baby and blessed the mother and blessed the baby and told what would be the future for it. See? Ordained to life. See? Look, there wasn't a dozen of them. There's only eight souls saved in the day of Noah. Hardly very many, but all that was ordained to life come in at that time. See how the Holy Spirit works in each age? Drawing the people. Now, we find out that Moses' faith led him to watch what would be, not what was. Look at tomorrow instead of today. Look at the promise instead of the glamour. Look at the people instead of the organization. See? God did that. Lot could see the glamour of prosperity down in, Egypt, uh, down in Sodom. Lot could see the possibilities of a of a, of a lot of, of money. Lot could see the pros- possibilities of when he looked over to Sodom and he could maybe become, being he was a Hebrew, he might become a great man there because he was a great intellectual uh, figure and uh, the nephew of Abraham. So he chose to go towards Sodom. Lot's intellects led him to see the glamour of, of prosperity. Lot's intellects led him to see the blessing of of glamour. But his faith was so paralyzed by it, he didn't see the fire that was going to destroy that sort of a life. And that's the way people are today. They see the possibilities of belonging to a great organization. They see the possibilities of having social standing with the people of the city. But they don't see the possibility. They don't see their faith is paralyzed. Let me repeat that so it won't be misunderstood. Women today, they, as I say, they want, to, they want to act like the movie stars. Uh, the man today want to act like the television comedians. The preachers today seem to want to make their churches like some modernistic lodge of some sort. Membership and so forth. They see the possibilities of maybe becoming a bishop or a general overseer or something like that. If they go along with the church forsaking the scriptures. When it's laying right before them, we're thoroughly vindicated by the power of God and by the living Word of God living in the people. Yet they don't want it. They say, we don't want to get mixed up with something like that. It would take their fellowship card. It would take their denominational order. Yet honest man, like Lot, sitting down in Sodom, knowing it, that's wrong. See? See, what do they do when they do that? They paralyze the little faith that they did have. It can't work. Now, Moses 
give away to that. And he said his faith paralyzed the world. Amen. Either your faith will paralyze glamour or either the glamour will paralyze your faith. Yeah. Now you have to take one or the other. And you see, the Bible don't change. God don't change. It's the unchangeable God. And now we find today that people of this day, see, they look to the big things, the big organization. I belong to the so-and-so. See? And they go down there and look. There's no different from the street people. There's no other things. They have a little intellectual something. You want. When you talk about divine healing, the pillar of fire, the light of God, they say that's mental. Yeah. A man picked up the picture of the angel Lord of the day, a Baptist minister, and laughed at it. See? That's, that's blasphemy. See? There's no forgiveness for that. That's what Jesus said. See, It's blasphemy. When you see it doing the very works that Christ did. And he said, when they seen that works in Christ, he was a sacrifice. And they called him Beelzebub, a devil, for because he was doing it. And now they say, he said, I forgive you for that. But when the Holy Ghost comes to do the same thing, you speak a word against it. It'll never be forgiven in this world or the world to come. See? Just one word is all you have to say against it. See? And then, because if that life, if you've been ordained to eternal life, then that life would burst forth when you've seen it. You'd recognize it like the little woman at the well and, and the different ones. But if it's not there, it can't come to life or there's nothing there to come to life with. As my old mother used to say, you can't get blood from a turnip because there's no blood in it. Yeah, now, that's the same thing. And it paralyzes what little faith you have, God. Lot could see the glamour, but he didn't have enough faith to see the fire that would destroy such glamour. I wonder if we have today. I wonder if us, us the women, that wants to be popular, that wants to act like the, the rest of the women in the church, if they see that they want to, to act like the rest, they, they can see the possibilities of being a, a, a prettier woman by being painted. They can see a prettier woman by having a younger appearance by cutting their hair uh, and acting like some of the others or the movie star. But I wonder if that hasn't paralyzed their faith to know that the Bible says that a woman does that is an, un, an inhonorable woman. And a woman that puts on a garment that pertains to a man is an abomination before God. Slacks and so forth and shorts that they're wearing. It, it just becomes so callous till it becomes a regular routine of the people doing it. I wonder if they don't paralyze the very little faith that you had even to go to Amen. church, you see. That's the thing it does. The Galat did that, and it paralyzed him, and it paralyzed his people down there. They couldn't see it. But Abraham, with an vindicated faith, his uncle... He looked not upon the glamour. He wanted nothing to do with it. Though he had to live hard and live to himself. And Sarah lived out in the wilderness where it was hard goings on the barren ground. But they seen not the glamour or the possibilities becoming popular. Sarah, the most beautiful woman in the land. The Bible said so. She was fair. The fairest of all the women. And now she even stayed and obeyed her husband. Even she called him her Lord who the Bible refers to, plumb over in the New Testament, said, whose daughters you are as long as you obey the faith. Amen. See? Amen. Called her husband her Lord. And the angel of the Lord visited their temple or their little uh, tent out there and told them they didn't even have a house to live in. Living out in the barren lands. And there you are. You see the day patterned back again just exactly like it was then. Now, uh, uh, Moses with his great faith again could say no to the present things of the present world and make a righteous choice. He chose to suffer the afflictions with the people of God. He chose to go with it. Why? His faith. He saw the promise. He saw the end time. He saw over in tomorrow. And he let his faith loose. And he didn't pay no attention to what his eyes saw and the possibility here that he was the Pharaoh and was going to be the Pharaoh. He looked plumb over in tomorrow. Amen. Oh, if people could only do Amen. that. Amen. Didn't see the present world. If you look at the present world, you make a choice with it. Amen. Hide your eyes from that. And look at the promise of God way over in tomorrow. By his faith, he could choose. He did choose to be called the son of Abraham and refused to be called the son of Pharaoh. How could he, when all the whole kingdom, Egypt had the world whipped? He was king of the world. And was a young man of 40 years old, here ready to take the throne. But he never looked at his interest. Look at the women would have laid around him day by day. Harems of them. 
Look at the glamour, set and drink wine and watch the striptease before him as they danced and fanned him uh, and uh, women from all over the world and the jewels and treasures and his army out there. The only thing he had to do was sit and eat his fine food and say, send an, uh, send an army uh, garrison number so-and-so down to so-and-so take that nation. I believe I just want it. That's all he had to do. Sit there and then fan him and hold his mouth open let the, the lovely, beautiful stripteases of that day pour wine into his mouth. Feed him his food with their arms around him, all the prettiest women in the world. All the glamour that there was laying right there by him. But what did he do? He looked away from that. He knew fire was there ready for that. He knew death laid in that line. See? He knew that it was. And he looked over to a bunch of despised and rejected people. And by faith, he chose to suffer the reproach of Christ and called himself, I'm a son of Abraham. I'm no son of this Pharaoh. Hallelujah. Though you make me a bishop or a deacon or an archbishop or a pope, I'm no son of this thing. I'm a son of Abraham. Who separate myself from the things of the world. Amen, amen, and amen. By faith did that. He took the glamour away. He took the possibilities of being the next bishop. He took the, the possibilities of being the next archbishop or the next general overseer at the next election or whatever it was. He took that away. He refused to look at it. Well, if I become the bishop, I walk in the people's uh, uh, holy father or uh, doctor so and so or, or or elder so and so. How they'll all the ministers at the gathering they'll pat me on the back and say, "Say, boy, that guy's got something." I'm telling you. He, oh, shh, 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 keep still. Here comes the bishop. See what he says? That's law. See? Here comes the so and so. People will fly over the world to be the see the Pope and kiss the foot and the rings and so forth. How what a possibility to the Catholic. What a possibility to the Protestant to be a bishop or general overseer or something. Some great man in an organization. Looking over, but you see, the eye of faith looks over the top of that. Amen. And you see the end of it down there, which God says the whole thing will be destroyed. Amen. Faith, that eagle eye lifts you up above that. And you see tomorrow. Not today. And choose to be called a son of Abraham. Pharaoh, with no faith, seen God's children as fanatics. No faith, he made them slaves because he wasn't scared of what he said. He wasn't afraid of God. He thought he, he was God. He thought his, his gods that he served. And he was a bishop. He was a head general overseer. His gods is the one that did it. Nothing to this thing here. So he made them slaves. He laughed at them, made fun of them, just as the people did today. The same thing exactly. Moses' faith seen them in the promised land, a blessed people. It might be a hard fight to get them to the promise, but Moses chose to go with them. How I can lay on that, but my time's getting away. Notice, it might be a hard thing to turn those people around. You have to go live with them. You have to be one of them. And they're already so intellectual that you can't move them. <laughs> but there's got to be something happen out there. There's got to be the supernatural demonstrated before them. It's going to be a hard thing. The organizations will turn you down and all these things will happen. It's, it's terrible what you have to do. But yet make your choice. I'm one of them. Yeah. His faith did that. His faith sparked. Yes, sir, he saw it. It's a hard thing to get him to that promise, but he took his choice to go with him anyhow. Regardless of what they did to him and what they turned him down, he went anyhow. He's going out with him. I hope you're reading. All right. Go with him anyhow. Make me one of them. Amen. That's right. Because it's your duty. Might be a hard fight, a lot to go through, but go anyhow. But his faith led him to take the choice of the word. And not the glamour. He tucked the word. That's what Moses' faith did. When faith looks on God's worst. Remember, here was the glamour now of the world, all the highest. King of the world. And where was God's promise? In the mud hole. The mud daubers. But when faith. When faith looks at God's worst, it esteems it. Greater and more valuable than the Amen. best the world can show. Amen. Yes, sir. Hallelujah. When faith looks at it, Amen. when faith can see it, when faith in the Word can see the Word made manifest, it's more to them than all the glamour and archbishopry and everything else you can speak of. Faith does it. Hallelujah. 
You can see the worst, the despise, the rejected, the whatever it might be. Let it be at its worst, and yet faithful esteem that a million miles higher than the best the world can produce. Amen. Amen. That's the way we sing that song. I'll take the way with the Lord's despised few. Hallelujah. Oh, my. For he see, faith sees what God wants done. Amen. Oh, I hope this goes in. Help us, Lord. Faith doesn't look at the present time. Faith doesn't see this year. Faith looks to see what God wants Amen. and works accordingly. That's what faith does. It sees what God wants and what God wants done. And faith operates through that. Faith is a long-range vision. Amen. It don't lower its sights. Amen. It holds to the target. <laughs> Amen. Yes. Any good shooter knows that. See, that It's long-range. It's, it's a telescope. It's a binocular. That you don't look around here. You don't use binoculars to look to see what time it is. See, You don't use that, but you use binoculars to look away off. Yeah. And faith does that. Faith picks up God's binoculars, both of them, both sides, the New and Old Testament, and sees every promise that He made. And faith sees it out yonder. And faith chooses that, regardless of what the present tense says here. He looks at the end. He don't drop his sights down to look this way. He looks out yonder. He keeps a crosshair dead center on the Word. That's what a faith does. That's the faith that's in a man that does those things. Now, what? What Pharaoh called a, a call, what Pharaoh called great, God called abomination. Pharaoh could say, Look, Moses, here, why, you're next Pharaoh. I, I hand this sepulcher to you. When I leave here, I hand this sepulcher. It's yours. See? Now, this is great. You're going to be a great man, Moses. You're going to be the bishop. You're going to be this, that, other. Don't leave us. You stay here. But you see, he called that great, and God said it was an abomination. Yeah. Now, you women, think a minute. So you man. What the world calls great, God calls filth. Yeah. Don't the Bible say it's an abomination for a woman to wear a garment pertains to a man? Yeah. And you think you're smart in doing it. You're just displaying female flesh for the devil. Yeah. That's all. So don't do it. You man who live at the things of the world and a huddling is cuddle after this. And you, man, with not enough audacity about you to make your wives and things, quit doing that. Shame on you and call yourself sons of God. Amen. Looks like sodomite to me. I mean, not to hurt your feelings, but to tell you the truth. Love is corrective. It always is. A mother won't take care of her child. Uh, correct it and spank it and make it mine is not much of a mother for it. That's right. Now, what's, what takes place now? Moses saw this by his vision. And Pharaoh said that this is great. God said it's abomination. So God, Moses chose what God said. Now notice, faith sees what God wants you to see. See? Faith sees what God sees. And reasoning and senses see what the world wants you to see. Notice, reasoning. Well, it's only human sense. It's only only reason. If this, this is well, this just as good. See, that's just exactly when you use those senses, which is contrary to the word. See, then that's what the world wants you to see. But faith don't look at that. Faith looks what God said. See, you don't. You cast down reasons. Reasons, uh, a reasoning sense sees what the world wants you to see. Big denomination. Well, are you a Christian? Oh, I'm I'm Presbyterian, Methodist, Lutheran, Pentecostal, what more? I'm this, that, or the other. See, that that senses. I belong to the first church, you see. Oh, I'm Catholic. I'm, I'm uh, this, that, see. You say that. Now that. That's senses. You like to say that because it's a denomination. Something being, well, we we, we got more members nearly than any church in the world, see. We, but there's only one real church. Amen. And you don't yeah. join it. You're born in it. Yeah. Right? And if you're born in it, the living God works Himself through you and Amen. making Himself known, see. That's where God dwells in His church. God goes to church every day. He lives in church. He lives in you. You're His church. Amen. Amen. You are His church. You're the tabernacle God dwells in. You are the church of the living God yourself. And if the living God lives in His living being, then your action is of God. Amen. If it isn't, then God isn't in there. He wouldn't make you act like that. When He says in a word, here's blueprint, don't do it, and you go do it. <laughs> See, that's wrong. When you deny it, then that shows the life isn't even in you. See, that's right. Faith led Moses to the path of obedience. Notice, Moses make there's young Pharaoh, 
there is young Moses, both of them with the opportunity. Moses seen the reproach of the people and counted greater treasures than all Egypt had. And he led by faith. He followed what his faith said in the Word. And it led him to the path of obedience and finally to glory, immortal, never to die in the presence of God. Sight and senses and glamour led Pharaoh to his death and the destruction of Egypt, his nation. And it's never come back since. There you are. Look at this. You die. Look at that, you live. Amen. Now make your choice. That's the same thing God put before Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Yes. See, by faith, you must make your choice. Now notice, sight led Pharaoh to his death and to destruction of his city. Moses, with his faith, never did fear Pharaoh. See, he didn't care what Pharaoh said. He cared not about Pharaoh, no more than his mother, his daddy cared about the threats. When Moses was confirmed to him and he was that person that was delivered to Egypt, or lead the uh, Israel out of Egypt, he never cared what Pharaoh said. He wasn't scared of him. (laughs) Amen, amen, amen. You see what I mean? There's no fear in faith. Faith knows about it. Faith, as I've always said, it's got great big muscles and hairs on the chest. Faith said, shout! Everybody shuts up. That's all. I know where I'm at. Rest and say, well, maybe he does. <laughs> but you've got to stand up and show your muscles. <laughs> That's all. Faith doesn't. Notice. Moses never feared Pharaoh after God vindicated his call. When Moses believed he was called for that, but when God told him up there, it's so, and come down and show before Pharaoh and all the rest of them that he was sent to do it. Moses never was scared of Pharaoh. <laughs> Notice, Pharaoh used his wisdom on Moses, though. Watch. He said, uh, I'll tell you what. I- I'll make an agreement with you after the plague's done to eat him up. He said, uh, I'll make an agreement with you. Uh, you just go for a little worship three days. Just go so far. And don't go no farther. But you know, the, that was Pharaoh's senses told him that. See? You just go so far and don't go no farther. Haven't we got that kind today? Yeah. If you did join church, that's all right. But you know, the faith that Moses had didn't believe in a so far religion. Amen. He said, we're all going. <laughs> we're going all the way. Try. Right. We're going to the promised land. We just don't go out here and make a denomination and stop. We go on through. Amen. I'm going on to the promised land. God promises. How many Pharaohs have we got today? Stand in the pulpit. Heads of organizations. Now, if you just do this and do that, that's all. Well, see, just so far. But Moses said, oh, no, 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 no. See, Pharaoh said, well, why not, if you're going to have that kind of religion, I'll tell you what you do. Just you and the elders go worship, see. Just you and the elders go worship because you all can have that kind of religion, but don't get it among the people. You know what Moses said? There won't even be a hoof left behind. (laughs) We're going all the way. We're all going. I'm not going unless they go as long as I'm here I'm on your hands. Amen. I'm not going unless they can go too. That's all. Oh, what a gallant servant. Amen. I want to take them with me. Just because I've got it and I sit down and say, well, now this is all right. No, sir. We want the people too. Every one of us is going. Amen. He said, well, I ain't going to even leave every sheep or anything behind. There's not going to be a hook left back. We're all going to the promised land. Amen. Every one of us, whether you're a housewife or whether you're a little maid or whether you're an old woman or a young man or an old man or whatever you are, we're going anyhow. There isn't going to be one of us left. Amen. Every one of us is going there. We ain't going to stop nothing else. That's right. My, them religions are really in the debate there, wasn't it? Oh, my. No, Moses did not believe in this year just so far religion. No, he didn't believe in that. <laughs> yes, sir. Oh, my. We can stay all day on that, but I've got to get you my text after a while and start preaching. Notice, Notice this. How beautiful. Oh, I love this. You know, finally, Pharaoh said, get out. <laughs> God just plagued him with the voice of Moses. He struck everything. He'd done everything there was to be done. He stopped. The, he put the sun down in the middle of the day. He'd done everything else. He, he blackened the days. He brought frogs, fleas, lice, everything else. Fire, smoke, and death to his families and everything else. He'd done everything to finally, Pharaoh had to say, get out. Take all you got and go. Oh, my. Praise be to God. I'm so glad that a man can so completely serve God till he, the devil don't know what to do with him. Right. Praise the Lord. 
just obey God so completely until the devil said, Oh, my, get away. I, I don't want to hear it no more. <laughs> That's right. You can do it. So completely. See, now if, if, if God wouldn't have backed up Moses, then he'd become a laughing stock. But God was right there confirming everything he said come to pass. And Pharaoh had to hold his position because he was a bishop, you know. So he, he had to stay there. He couldn't, den- he couldn't say no because it was already happening. <laughs> See? He couldn't, he couldn't deny it because it was already happening. So finally he said, oh, just get out. I don't want to hear you no more. Get out of here. Take all you got and go. Oh, my. Now, we find Moses here after God had done so much for him and had showed him so many signs and wonders. Now, for the next 15 minutes, let's lay this down here. Watch real close. Moses come to this spot where he, God had said, I'm with you. Your words is my word. I proved it to you, Moses. You, there was no flies in the land. It's out of season. And you said, let there come flies. And there come flies. That's creation. Who can bring darkness over the earth but God? You said, let there be darkness. And there was darkness. You said, let there be frogs. And the frogs even got in Pharaoh's house and in the beds. And when they piled them up in great heaps. Creator. And I have spoke to you, Moses, and, and made my word create through your lips. I made you actually a God before Pharaoh. Yes, sir. I've done all this. And here they come to a place, a little trial come up, and Moses begin to cry. What shall I do? I want you to notice. This is a great lesson here. Now, I, I love this. See? see, Moses, if we read here, right, that Mo, when the children begin to get scared, they've seen Pharaoh coming after them in the line of duty. God had performed everything perfectly. Now he started them on their journey. He's got the church together. They've been called out. They come from every denomination. They all got together. Moses went back there and said, Lord, what must I do? He said, well, go do this. All right. Go ahead. Now, Moses, you know I've called you to do this. Yes, Lord. All right, you go speak this. It'll be, here come the flies. Speak for this. Here it comes. Do this. Here it comes. Everything was, thus saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. Now he gets into trouble. And God said, now I've got them started on their journey. They're all done called out. The church is together. So I've got them on the journey. Now, Moses, take them on over. I told you. Do I'm going to sit down and rest a while. Yes, Moses said, oh, Lord. Look, come in here. Here comes Pharaoh. The people are all, what must I do? What must I do? See there? Isn't that just human being? Yes, sir. Begin to cry, what must I do? Here we see Moses expressingly, fully, human nature. Always wants God to get behind you and push you into something. Now that's us today. You want God, after we've seen all we've seen, yet you want God to push you to do something. See? Moses had just laxed around and said, God will go ask you to see what you say. Yeah, yeah, you say, well, all right, I'll say it too. See? But here God had ordained him for the job, proved that he was with him, and here he is, the circumstance comes up, and then he begins to cry, what can I do? Lord, what can I do? Now, you remember, he had already prophesied here, for he said, these Egyptians, that you see today, you'll see no more. And then immediately begin to cry, God, what can we do? <laughs> and he'd done, done a pretty good job in prophesying there. He'd done told him what would happen if the word of God was in him, it was in him. And when he was telling that, it actually come to pass. What he said was already going to come to pass. Amen. And here it was crying out, what am I going to do? Amen. Oh, if that isn't human beings. Amen. If that isn't me. If that isn't me. Yeah, and already prove what you say will happen. I'm with you. And here a circumstance rolls in a moment. What must I do? What must I do, Lord? Hey, Lord, where are you at? Hey, do you hear me? What must I do? And it already ordained him and vindicated him and proved and worked everything through him. And here, God, oh my, fully expressive. Man wants to rest and let God do the pushing. And yet he knew that God had anointed him for this job to do this. And God had clearly vindicated his claims. It was time for the people to be delivered. God, through his miracles and wonders, had drawn them all together in one group. Amen. You follow me? Amen. Brought them all together in one group. Amen. Vindicated his claims. Scripture said so. Here was a sign. Here was the evidence. Here everything that he said. Then he come among them as a prophet. Hey, well, whatever he said, God honored it. Amen. Even to create and bring up flies and to put things in existence. And everything that he had promised him, here he done it. 
But he wanted to wait on thus saith the Lord. See? He should have known that the very vindication of his call was thus saith the Lord. His job that he was ordained to was thus saith the Lord. Can you get it? Hmm. Why did he wait on thus saith the Lord? He wanted, Lord, what can I do? Here I brought these children out here this far. Here's the circumstance. Pharaoh's coming. They're all going to die. What must I do? What must I do? Mm-hmm. He had already predicted what they was going to do. He had already told just exactly what to do. He predicted the end of the very nation he was brought up in. Yeah. Amen. Amen. I hope you understand. Yeah. Huh? Yes. Moses already said, you'll not see him anymore. God's going to destroy him. They made fun of you long enough. God will destroy him. It already predicted what would happen to him. Then, Lord, what must I do? See the human nature there? What must I do? I'm going to wait for thus saith the Lord. Yes, sir. I'll see what the Lord says and I'll do it. (laughs) Remember, there was a Pharaoh had raised up and didn't know Joseph, you know. In that time. Right at that time. And, And Moses stood right up and predicted the end of that nation. And here he was right to the place where it was to be happening. And then he cries out, what must I do, Lord? What must I do? See? Isn't that human beings? Isn't that just human nature? What shall I do? He was already prophesied. God had honored everything he said. And he was called for the job. So why did he have to say, what must I do? There was a need. It's just up to him to speak for it. God wanted Moses to put that gift of faith that he had given him to work. Amen. God had vindicated it. It was the truth. And God wanted Moses, wanted the people to see that he was with Moses. And he back there, he waited. Said, now, Lord, I'm just a baby. Don't you tell me now. Yeah, I'll go do this. I got thus saith the Lord. Brother, is that thus saith the Lord? Yes, yes, Brother Moses. That's thus saith the Lord. Yeah, okay. We got it now. Thus saith the Lord. And it happened. Never failed one time. Never did fail. And here it is in the circumstances. Comes up again. Now he's got him on the journey. The church is already called out. Got him on the journey. And they're moving up. And Moses started crying out, Lord, is it thus saith the Lord? What must I do? All right. God wanted Moses, that faith that he had put in, in that gift that he had clearly vindicated. God had clearly proved to Moses and the people that it was him by the word and by the things that was said come to pass. It was clearly identified. There was no need of him worrying anymore about it. Yeah, See? There's no more of him thinking anything about because it was already cleared up. He'd already done these things. He'd already proved by uh, uh, flies and fleas that he spoke things into creation. That the Word of God was in him. So here he is going to ask now what to do when the circumstances lays right before him. See? Oh, my. I hope this goes way down to us and we can see where we're at. See? Don't make you feel about that being. Thinking about Moses telling his faults and look at ours. Here he was standing there, see. Know that the scripture said that that was the hour and day for that to happen. And know that God had met him in a pillar of fire. And it went right down before the people and performed these miracles and everything he said had come to pass, even bringing things into creation. Doing the things that only God could do. Showing that his voice was God's voice. And here was a circumstance with that people that he was raising up, bringing on to the promised land, and then was standing crying, what must I do? That's a human being. Well, just as uh, Brother Roy Slaughter, I believe he's sitting outside the door there, told me one time about somebody doing something to me, and I said, well, I did this, and now is that. He said, Brother Branham, let them lean on your shoulder today, and tomorrow you pack them. And that's just the way human beings is. <laughs> lean on your shoulder today, and tomorrow you pack them. That's, a, that's what Moses is doing. God had to pack him along after he had ordained him and proved it to do it. And the people already said, Moses, say the word. Yeah. I've seen you do it there. God honored you there. You're the same one today. Amen. Do it. Amen. He ought to have known it, but he didn't. All right. Just as it was then, so is it now. We find out that, so he said, God must have just got enough of it. God must have got fed up on it. He said, why are you crying to me about? Haven't I already proved my identification? Haven't I told you that I sent you for the job? Didn't I tell you to go do this? 
Didn't I promise that I'd do this, that I'd be with your mouth? And I'd speak through you, and I'd do this, and you'd show signs and wonders. Didn't I promise to do it? Have not I did just exactly destroyed every enemy from around you? And here you are standing out here now at the Red Sea, right in the line of duty, what I told you to do, and then still hollering and crying to me. Don't you believe me? Can't you see that I sent you to do this? Oh, that isn't human being. My. So he just must have got uh, pretty well fed up on it. And he said, um, you know, you have need of it. You know, if you go take these children over to that promised land, that's exactly you're pinned up here in the corner. There ain't nothing else you can do. So there's a need. What are you crying to me about? <laughs> what you looking at me for? What you calling on me about? Haven't I proved it to the people? Haven't I proved it to you? Haven't I called it? Isn't it scriptural? Didn't I promise to take this people to that land? Didn't I call you and tell you I would do it? Didn't I call and say I'd sent you to do it? And it wasn't you, it was me. And I'd go down and I'd be with your lips and whatever you said, I'd, I'd vindicate it and prove it. Haven't I done it? Then when any little thing comes up, way act like a baby, you ought to be a man. Speak to the people. Amen. Then move forward. Amen. There you are. Don't cry. Speak. Amen. Oh, I like that. Why are you crying to me about? Just speak to the people and go forward to your objective. Whatever it is, if it's sickness or whatever it is to raise the dead or whatever it is, speak. I proved it. Speak to the people. What a lesson. What a lesson. Oh, my. At this stage of the journey where we're standing. Look where we're at now. Yes, sir. At the third pull. Hallelujah. Notice, we're right here at the door of the coming of the Lord. He was anointed for the job and still waiting for thus saith the Lord. God must have just got enough of it. He said, don't cry anymore. Speak. I sent you. Oh, God. What this church ought to be this morning. God's perfect vindication. But the pillar of fire and the signs and the wonders. Everything just like it was in the days of Sodom. He said it would return back. Here's a world in its condition. There's a nation in its condition. There's a woman in the condition. There's a man in the condition. There's a church in the condition. There's everything. The elements, signs, flying saucers and everything in the skies and all kind of mysterious things. And the sea of roar and tidal waves. Man's heart failing, fear, perplexed of time, distress between nations. The church falling away and a man of sin rising up who opposed himself above all is called God. He that sitteth in the temple of God showing himself Oh my. And it's come to this nation. And the church is organized and all of them gathered together as harlots to the whore. And everything exactly in the way. Hoard them. Hoard them. What is it? Tell them women they can cut their hair. Tell them women they can wear shorts. Tell men that they can do this and they can do that. And the preachers they do this in the social gospel. And they, Don't you see? It's committing adultery with the true word of God. And God has sent us His true word. Undenominational. No strings tied to it. And give us a pillar of fire. The Holy Ghost has been with us now for 30 years. And everything that He's predicted and said, Come to pass exactly the way. Speak to the people and let's go forward. Amen. We got an objective. That's glory. Let's move to it. We're headed to the promised land. All things are possible to them that believe. Speak to the people. Haven't I proved it? Haven't I even had my picture made among you and everything else and done everything that could be done to prove that I'm with you? Doesn't the magazine just a few weeks ago pack the article? When you said here at the pulpit what would take place out here three months beforehand and there it went taking place and vindicated. Even the science knows about it. Yeah. And everything that I've done and you're That's still right. waiting. That's right. Oh, yeah. Speak to the people and go forward to your objective. Amen. Didn't Nathan tell David, Nathan the prophet one time said he, seeing David the anointed king, he said, do all that's in your heart for God is with you. Told David, do all that's in your heart. God's with you. Joshua was anointed to take the land for God and for his people. The day was short. He needed more time for the job that he was anointed and commissioned to do. Joshua, a man. He was anointed. God told him as I was with Moses, I'll be with you. Yes. Amen. That land, I'm going to give it to him. 
And I want you to go over there and clean out the Amalekites and, and the, uh, hey, uh, all, all the others, the Philistines and, and the Persianites and all the different ones. Clean them out. I'm with you. Oh, no man will stand before you all the days of your life. No man can bother you. Go on in there. And Joshua drawed that sword and said, follow me. And he got over there and here he was fighting. And what was it? He routed the enemy. There were little bunches here, little bunches there. When nighttime come, they'd all get together and garrison together and come with a big force against him. And the sun was going down. He needed more light. The sun was going down. He didn't fall on his knees and said, Lord, God, what shall I do? What shall I do? He spoke. He had a need. He said, Son, stand still. Praise the Lord. He didn't cry to nothing. He commanded. Son, stand still. I've got a need of this. I'm the servant of the Lord anointed for this job. And I've got a need. Stand still and don't you shine. And moon, you hang where you're at. Until he fought the battle through and whipped the whole thing on. And the son obeyed him. No crying out. He spoke to the sun, said, you stand still. Sun, hang there. And moon, you stay where you're at. He didn't cry out, Lord, now what can I do? Give me some more sunlight. He hadn't needed sunlight, so he commanded it. And the sun obeyed him. Oh, my. He commanded the sun to stand still. Samson, anointed, raised up, ordained of God, given a gift of power was ordained to destroy the nation of the Philistines. Ordained, born on the earth, anointed of God to destroy the Philistines. And one day they caught him out in the field without his sword, without a spear. And a thousand of those armored Philistines run upon him at one time. Did he get down and say, Oh, Lord, I'm waiting for a vision. Oh, Lord, what must I do? Direct me now what to do. He knew he had a need. He found nothing but an old jawbone of a mule and he beat down a thousand Philistines. Amen. 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 He never cried to God. He used his anointed gift. Amen. He knew that he was sent for the job. He knew he was born for that. He knew he was anointed with a gift. Then he beat down a thousand Philistines. He didn't cry to God. God ordained him and vindicated that he was by other things that he had done. And he was a vindicated, anointed servant of God to destroy the Philistines, and he did it. Amen. No matter what the circumstances was, he did it. He never asked nothing. That was his job. That God was dealing to him. Pick up that mule bone and go to beating Philistines. Yeah. How the why one lick with that thing across one of them inch and a half brass skulls like that would have shattered that bone into a million pieces, and he beat a thousand of them down and killed them, and still stood with it in his hand. Amen. He didn't ask no questions. He didn't cry out. He spoke. (laughs) He routed him. Oh, man. Take the Philistines. Can I take the Philistines, Lord? I I know you sent me to do it, Lord. Yes, Lord, I know you sent me to destroy this nation of the Philistines. Now, uh, here are a thousand of them around me, and I ain't got nothing. What what am I going to do now, Lord? Oh, my. Nothing's going to bother him. He's anointed for the work. There's nothing can harm you. No, not one thing. Hallelujah. He just took what he had and beat into him. That's right. When the enemy fenced him in and said, now we get him in the walls. We got him now. We got him on the inside here with, with this woman. Now we got the good door shut all around everywhere and he can't get out. We got him. Samson didn't cry. Oh, Lord, they got me all fenced in with this denomination. <laughs> what am I going to do? I've joined up with it. What am I going to do? He never did that. He just walked out and pulled down the gate, put it on his shoulder, and walked away with it. Amen. Amen. He was anointed for the job. He's called of God. Didn't fence him in. No, indeed. He tucked the gates with him. He didn't pray about it. He didn't ask God whether to do it or not. It was right in the line of duty. Amen, amen, amen. Right in the line of duty. Why cry to me? Speak and go on. Amen. Don't cry, speak. You don't quit whining and whimpering now. You ought to be old enough to speak. <laughs> That's right. He knew his anointed gift of power could destroy any Philistine that stood before him. Uh, amen. Amen. But we don't know that, you see. <laughs> We're still little babies and with a bottle in our mouth. And, mm. He knew it! Amen. You know that God raised him up for that purpose. 
And there was nothing going to stand before him all the days of his life. Nothing could destroy him. He was raised for that purpose like Moses was. Nothing going to stop him. No Amalekites or nothing else can stop him. He's on the road to the promised land. Amen. Samson knew he was on the road. Joshua knew he was taking the land. He was a vindicated. God's word promised it and the Holy Ghost was there vindicating it. He was on his road so there's nothing going to stand in his way. No, sir. Right in the line of duty with God, there was nothing going to stand in his way. So he just picked up the gates and put them on his shoulder, weighed about four or five tons and walked up on top of the hill and sat down on them. <laughs> nothing going to stand in his way. He had an anointed gift from God. <laughs> he didn't have to cry out, Lord, what must I do now? He's already anointed to do it. That was thus saith the Lord. Get rid of him. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes, amen. Get rid of him. I raise you up for that purpose. Yes. Amen. amen. What must I do, Lord? Okay, what am I going to do here to Red Sea? Didn't I tell you that I give you a mountain for a sign out here? You're coming back to that mountain. And you're going to take these children to the land. Didn't I call you for that purpose? Amen. What are you worried about? Anything else? Stand in the way. Speak and start moving. Amen. Amen and amen. God. Well, I called you for this purpose. Yeah. David, he knew he was anointed and was vindicated to be a good shot. Yeah. He knew that they knew he was a good shot. David was anointed. He knew it. And when he stood before Goliath, he never cried, Oh, God, what must I do now? But, 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 but I, I, I know what you did in times past. You, you, you let me kill a bear and you let me kill a lion. But what about this Goliath out here? Huh. He never did that. He just spoke. What did he say? You will be like they were. <laughs> he spoke and went forward. He never prayed a prayer. He never offered nothing. He knew he was anointed. Hey, man, his anointed in that slingshot had proved the right kind of a thing. He had faith in his anointing. He had faith that God could direct that Hallelujah. rock right straight in the middle of that uh, helmet there where the only place could be hit. He'd stand there. He knowed he was a good shot. Amen. Amen. He knowed God made him that. Amen. Amen. He knowed he'd killed a lion. He knowed he killed a bear. But if that was with his earthly father's possession, here's his heavenly father's possession. Amen. Amen. He didn't get out much. What must I do now, Lord? He spoke. And said, you will be like the lion and the bear. And here I come. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. Yes, sir. He spoke and went forward to meet this Goliath. Oh, man. Regardless of his size. <laughs> He's a little ruddy looking fellow. You know, he wasn't very big. He wasn't very handsome to look at. A little bitty drawn up sort of a fellow. The Bible said he was ruddy. Now, regardless of his size and his so-called ability to do so. You know, the, the bishop told him, said, now look here, son. That man's a theologian. <laughs> See, he is a fighter. He was born a fighter. <laughs> and he's, a, he's been a fighter from his youth. And you're no match for him. And his brother said, oh, you naughty thing. Come out here to do such a thing as that. Get on back home. That didn't bother him. <laughs> wow. He knew he was anointed. Amen. The God that delivered me from that line. The God that delivered me from the paws of that bear, you more than that delivered me from that Philistine. Here I come. I meet you in the name of the Lord God of Israel. Hey, Amen. Didn't pray through. He's already prayed through. God prayed him through before the foundation of the world. He was anointed for the job. He had to speak and go forward. That's all there was to do about it. Just speak and go forward. Oh, that's all there was to it. Oh, he didn't. About his denominational brothers, them scoffers stand there too, you know. Oh, yes. They would stand there saying scoffing and making fun and saying his brothers, you know, and say, oh, do you care? You, you're just naughty. That didn't move him a bit. You want to be different from somebody else. You just want to show off. If that had been showing off, it had been so. But they only looked at the intellectual side. David knowed the anointing oil was on him. <laughs> Making difference to him. He said, that Philistine will be like the barren lion. So here I come. He predicted it before it happened. What did he do? He killed the bear. He killed the lion. He knocked the lion down with what with? With the, uh, with the slingshot and took a knife and then the bear, lion, he killed the lion with a knife. That's the same thing he'd done to Goliath. He knocked him down with a rock and pulled up his sword and cut his own head off right there before. What did he predict before it happens? And you will be as they are. Yeah. Why? He spoke the word that it would be and then went forward to make it be fulfilled. Yeah. Amen. Oh, brother, he spake and took over the situation that day. If there ever was a time that man should speak, it's now. 
closing just the next few minutes, if you can just bear a few minutes longer. I got some more things wrote down here, some scriptures I want to get to. Peter never cried when he found a man that had faith enough to be healed. Laying at the gate called Beautiful. He never got down and had an all night's prayer and, or all day's prayer, a big long prayer, and said, uh, Lord, uh, I pray you now that you'll help this poor lame man. I see that he's got faith. I know he's a believer. And I've asked him, and he, he, I, I, he said he had faith. He'd believe what I told him. And I've told him about, this, about what you did. And I, I just think now, Lord, uh, you, can you give me a thus saith the Lord for him? <laughs> no. He knew that he was anointed apostle. He knew that Jesus Christ commissioned him, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers. Cast out devils Amen. as freely as you receive, freely give. The Lord. He said, Peter, go do that. He didn't have to pray through. He was commissioned. Amen. What did he say? He said, in the name of Jesus Christ, he spoke. Amen. The name of Jesus Christ. And the man just laid there. He picked him up by the hand and said, stand up on your feet. Amen. And he held him there until his ankle bone got strength. And he started walking. Amen. Why? He never had an all-night's prayer meeting. He never cried out to God. He knew positive from the lips of Jesus Christ he was anointed for this work. Him. He spake and raised him up, for he knew he was anointed apostle for the purpose. The people that laid in his shadow never said, Oh, come, Apostle Peter, and cry over us and pray the prayer of faith for us to God. No, no, they never said that. They knew he was anointed and a vindicated apostle of God. So they said, Just let us lay in his shadow. Hey, you don't have to say a word. We know it. We believe it. Life within them. The apostle couldn't get to them all. And they themselves, they're part of it. Moses said, you said something me going. We're all going. Amen. We all got something to do. We've all got to be anointed. And they seen that apostle stand there and seen him heal this sick man and do the things he did. They know he couldn't get to him. So they never said, Peter, come and, uh, and offer a prayer and wait now until you got thus saith the Lord and come tell me. See what the Lord says. They said, if we can only lay in his shadow because the very God that was in Jesus Christ Amen. is in him. And we see the same thing doing. So they touched the border of Jesus' garment and laid in his shadow and Jesus is in this man. If that shadow can reflect the Holy Spirit, be healed. And the Bible said every one of them is healed. All right. No old nice nice prayer meeting said, Lord, if I go lay in the shadows of this apostle. Well, no, they knew it. The light has struck them. Their hearts was full. Their faith was let loose. Amen. They believed it. They had seen it. Paul's hanky is the same way. Now in closing, Jesus never cried when they brought the maniac boy to him that had epilepsy falling into the fire. He never said, Father, I'm your son. And now you sent me here to do so and so and so. Can I heal this boy? He never said. He said, come out of him, Satan. He spoke, and the boy was made well. When he met Legion with 2,000 devils in him, it wasn't Jesus a crying, it was the devils a crying. Yeah. If you're going to cast us out, oh my. <laughs> Suffers to go in that herd of swine. Jesus there said, Now, Father, am I able to do this? He said, Come out of him. Yeah. And the devils took their flight. Sure, he knowed he was Messiah. At the grave of Lazarus. He'd been dead four days. They said, if you would have been here, Lord, he would have not have died. He said, I am the resurrection of life. Amen. Not where, when, or how. No. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Amen. Amen. He knew who he was. He knew what he was. He knew that he was Emmanuel. He knew that he was a resurrection. He knew he was life. He knew that in him dwelt the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Amen. We've seen them little people there, and you've seen that, what God had told him that to do, and there he was. He went down there. He never said, now wait, I'll kneel down here. All of you kneel down and pray. He said, you believe it? I'm able to do this? Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Uh, yes, boy, it wasn't him. It was them. Amen. Yeah. Amen. yeah, Lord, I believe that you're the Son of God that was uh, to come into the world. Oh, my, there he's identified. Something's got to happen. Uh, Lazarus. Come forth, he spoke, and a dead man come forth. Not can I, he just spoke. And when the faith was met, the thing happened. He speak, he spoke, and the blind saw. 
The lame walked. The deaf heard. Devils screamed and come out. The dead was raised up. Everything. Why? He didn't pray through. He was anointed the Messiah. He was that Messiah. He knew he was. He knew his position. He knew what he was set to do. He knew that the Father had identified him to be the Messiah to the believer. And when he met that believer with faith, he just spoke the word. Uh, Devil scattered. Uh, yes, sir. Speak. Uh, don't cry. Speak. Amen. My God. And he knew his God-given rights, but we don't. Yep. He knew what he was. We don't. Moses had forgot. Samson understood. <laughs> Others understood. Joshua understood. Moses forgot. God had to call his attention to it. He said, why are you crying to me? I sent you to do the job. Speak. Go on to your objective. I told you you'd come to this mountain. Take them children and lead them on. Just speak. I don't care what's in your way. Move it out of the way. I give you authority to do it. I spoke. You spoke flies and fleas and creation and things like that. Now, what are you hollering to me about? Why are you coming to me hollering these things? Just speak and watch it move. That's all. Oh, my. Oh, how I love it. Here, Jesus, everything that he said, he just spoke the word, and it was so. God properly had vindicated him to be his son. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear ye him. Watch him. I like this. How bravely, how majestically he stood before his critics. He said, destroy this temple. And I'll pray the Father and see what he does about it. Destroy this temple. And I'll raise it up again. Amen. Not I hope to. I'm going to try to. I will do it. Amen. Why? The scripture said so. Amen. The same scripture that said he'd raise up his body. Give us the authority. The uh, power. Amen. In my name they shall cast out devils. They'll speak with new oh. tongues. If they take up serpents or drink deadly things, they won't harm them. If they lay their hands on the sick, they shall recover. Uh, Why cry unto me? Speak and go forward. Oh, bravely. I destroy this temple. I'll raise it up again. Oh. And remember now, we're closing. It was that same He. It was He that said in John 14, 12. The, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. Is that right? It was He that said so. It was Jesus in Mark eleven twenty four that said, If you say to this mountain, now if you pray to this mountain, if you say to this mountain, be moved. Amen. And don't doubt in your heart, but believe that what you've said will come to pass. You can have what you've said. Now, you, if you say it just presumptuously, it won't happen. But if something in you, that's, you're, you're anointed for the job, and will know that it's the will of God to do it, and will say it, it's got to happen. Amen. If ye, it was he that said this, if ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask what you will, and it shall be done to you. Oh, my, oh, my. You see what I mean? Pardon this. It's just coming up in me. I've got to say it. It was he that said that day up on the side of that woods, you have no game. And he created three squirrels standing there before us. What is it? Just speak in the word and say they'll be there and there and there and there they was. It was he that did that. Charlie, Rodney, it was he down there in Kentucky, and Nellie and Margie and the rest of you. It was he, that same God that was back there and spoke to Moses and said, Why do you cry to me? Speak the word. It was he that brought them into existence. It's he, it's him. Oh, my. It was he that gave the vision about a year ago that said we would go over there and these seven seals and how there would be a, 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 a great thunder that would start it off and it'd be in the shape of a pyramid and there the look mag- Life magazines packed and hanging on the wall in there. It was he that said that. It was he that night when I was going down that road and seeing that big mumba snake about to get my brother. And he said, you've given, been given power to bind him or any of the rest of them. It was he that said that. To my little gray-headed wife sitting back there, it was he that morning that woke me up there in the room and standing in the corner and said, Don't fear to do anything or go anywhere or say anything, for the never-failing presence of Jesus Christ is with you wherever you go. Hallelujah. 
It was he up in our Sabina Canyon about three months ago when I was praying, wondering what was going to happen. I standing there and a sword dropped in my hand and said, this is the king's sword. Amen. It was he. Hallelujah. It was he that said to me, as I was with Moses, so I'll send you. It was he that said to me, 30 years ago, down on the river yonder, Hallelujah. as a little boy standing there as a little preacher on the river 30 years ago, standing there when that light, the same pillar of fire come down from the heavens and stood there and said, as I sent John the Baptist to forerun the first coming of Christ, your message shall forerun the second coming to all the world. How could it be when my own pastor laughed and made fun of it? But it happened just exactly that way. It was he that said it. Yes, sir. Oh, ha, ah, it was he that said in prophecy to the vision, it shall come to pass. It was he that said, if one among you prophesies or sees a vision and tells it and it comes to pass, then remember, it's not him, it's me. I am with him. Amen. Oh, my. What could I go on and say, it's he, it's he, it's he. It's he that come down. When I told him that the pillar of fire was down there on the river and they couldn't believe it, it was he down there amongst that Baptist preacher for 30,000 people that night in the San Houston Coliseum when that angel of the Lord had his picture taken standing there. It was he, the same yesterday, today, and forever. It was he that foretold where these things would be. It was he that said this. It was he that done these things. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's done everything just exactly like he said he would do it. Hey, man. Why should I wait? God's have vindicated the word. It's the truth. Yes, amen. Let's journey. Let's walk. Let's amen. go on the walk of the Lord. Amen. Laying aside all doubts, all sins. Clean up the house. Scrub it up as Junior Jackson's vision said there was nothing left but lamps. Or his uh, dream if he's sitting here. Nothing left but lamps. And they had gold bands around them. In the dream that he gave me the other night. Oh, my Brother Collins, don't worry about that fish. It was white. You just didn't know how to handle it. Lay aside everything else contrary to it. Remember, this is truth regardless of how fanatically it seems and everything else sometimes. Move right on with it. It's the Holy Spirit, the same God that raised up Jesus Christ from the dead. The same one that can speak things into existence. The same one that lived in the days of Moses is the Amen. same today. His call in this last day, he's vindicated as it was in the days of Sodom. So shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. He's done there. Sodom down there. There's a Billy Graham and an Oral Roberts out there. And the church is moving on by the same signs that he promised both places. And there they are. It's he that said it. Oh, Lord, give me courage is my prayer. Help me, oh, Lord God. I have to quit here. It's getting late. Why cry to me? Why are you crying to me when I've proved to be with you? Haven't I healed your sick, he'd say. Haven't I told you things that happened just exactly? Your pastor can't do that. Me. He can't. He's a man. It's me, the Lord. And he would say, I'm the one that did this. I'm the one that tells him these things and say, it's not him. It's my voice. I'm the one that raises up your dead when they drop down. I'm the one that heals the sick. I'm the one that foretells these things. I'm the one that does the saving. I'm the one that gives the promise. God, give me courage to take that sword of the word that he put in my hands about 33 years ago and hold it and march forward to the third pool. Is my prayer. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, the hour is growing late, but the word is getting precious. As we see it, Lord, time after time, never failing presence of Christ always meets with us. How I thank you for your goodness, how you spared us and been and blessed us, how we thank you for it. As I hold these handkerchiefs in my hand, Lord, it's people that has faith that believes this. May every devil, every sickness depart from them people. And I charge every spirit in here that's foul and not of God, every spirit of sickness, all diseases and afflictions. We're not laying in the shadow of man, which would be all right, but we're in the shadow of the gospel, vindicated gospel. As a great pillar of fire moves back and forth through this building, the same one that God looked down through and the Red Sea give up its course and Israel passed through. But now as he looks, it's sprinkled with the blood of his own son. With mercy and grace, may we be obedient. May we today quit saying, crying out. May we realize that you've called us for this work. 
This is the hour. I speak it in the name of Jesus Christ. Let every sickness depart from this place. May every man and woman that calls on the name of Jesus Christ consecrate their life anew today. I consecrate mine, Lord, upon the altar of prayer. I lay myself down and shame my own self and turn my head towards the ground from where you tuck me. Lord God, I'm ashamed of my weakness and my unbelief. Forgive it, Lord. Give me courage. Give us all courage. I feel like Moses. We're all on a road out. We don't want to leave one. We want to take every one, Lord. They're yours. I claim them for you. Bless this people today, Lord. Grant it. Bless me with them, Father. And thy name shall be praised. Thy glory shall be thine. Give us this eternal faith, Lord. As we consecrate ourselves to thee now, me over this Bible and over this stand, I give you my life, Lord. I'm depending on every promise that you give. I know they will be confirmed. I know they are truth. Give me courage to speak these words. Give me courage, Lord. Direct me in what I shall do and say. I give myself to you with this church along with it, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ. My faith looks up to Thee, Thou Lamb of Calvary, Savior divine, now hear me while I pray. sins away. Oh, let me from this day be holy. Now let's stand real quietly as we hum it. Mm -hmm. To thee, thou lamb. Let's just raise your hands to him now. Oh, Savior, consecrate yourself to God now. Now, while I pray, take all my doubts away. Oh, let me from this day be whole. Now together with her hands up. Lord Jesus, I now consecrate myself to Thee a life of service. More purely, more faith I cry that I might be a more acceptable servant in my coming life than I have been in the life that's past. Forgive my unbelief and restore to us the faith that was once delivered to the saints. I give myself to Thee in the name of Jesus Christ. As we bow our heads. Oh, life's dark maze I tread and grief around me spread be thou my guide bid darkness turn to day wash all my fears away nor let me ever stray from the sign as we bow our heads now you feel like that the morning message has done you good Amen. give you courage Amen. if you would just raise your hands to God saying God I thank you. thank you I got both my hands up because I just feel so that it's it's helped thank me it's given me courage some things I said I didn't think I was going to say it, but it's already said. 
is a rebuke to me. I found myself, I'm not in the way that I thought I did, but I found myself guilty of crying out all the time instead of speaking. God, help me from this hour on that I'll be a more consecrated servant. Not only me I pray for, I pray for you also. That together as a body of Christ called out from the world, making ready for the promised land, that God will give me courage to speak the way, make the way clear that you won't miss the trail. I'll tell you, by the grace of God, I'll follow the bloody footprints of him who went on before us. And this consecrated cross I'll bear until death shall set me free. And then go home a crown to wear. There's a crown for me. We give this to thee, Father, our consecration. In the name of Jesus Christ, thy Son. Amen. We thank the Lord for this. Walk a consecrated life. Give yourself over to sweetness, humility. Walk in the Spirit. Walk, talk, dress, act like Christians. Humble and sweet. Don't let this fail now. The voice of God speaks through the Word, speaks through gifts. As one gift comes, another expresses it. Another gift comes and expresses the same thing. See, that's... Sure, right with the word and right with the hour. God is with us. How we thank him for it. Now, if I, with our heads bowed, if our sister would give us a card on, take the name of Jesus with you as a shield from every snare. And when temptations around you gather, just breathe that holy name in prayer. Just, just do that. Speak the word. Speak his name. Let's sing now as, we, as we've been dismissed. Take the name of Jesus with you. As a deep land of war, it will joy and comfort give you. Oh, take it everywhere you go, precious name. Now let's shake one another's hands and say, I pray for you, brother. You pray for me. Heaven, precious name. Precious name, oh how sweet hope of earth and joy. Now with our heads bowed, let's sing this next verse. Take the name of Jesus with you as a shield from every snare. When temptations round you gather. Breathe that holy name in prayer. Precious name, precious name, oh how sweet, oh how sweet, hope of earth and joy of heaven. Precious name, oh how sweet, hope of earth. With our heads bowed now and our hearts with it. With the realization that Jesus said, He that heareth my words and believeth on him that sent me has everlasting life and shall not come up in the judgment, but has passed from death unto life, knowing that we, by the grace of God, possess that within our bosom, with a consecration to Him this morning that our lives shall change from this day on, that we'll be more positive in our thinking. We will try to live in such sweetness and humility that believing in what we ask God, God will give it to each other. And we will not speak evil against each other or no man. We shall pray for our enemies and love them. Do good to them and do bad to us. God is the judge of who is right and wrong. With the, on the basis of this, and our heads bowed. I'm going to ask our good friend, Brother Lee Vale, if he'll dismiss the audience in a word of prayer. Brother Vale.